Well, good evening. evening. It's good to see everybody. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your loving kindness towards us, Lord. We thank you for this place that we can um, come in and stop everything else, Lord, and fix our eyes solely on you. Draw us with your spirit, Lord. Draw us into your presence. Lord, just do a move among your people here tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song. Come hear the story of love divine As earth is invaded with Promise of ages, now flesh and bone. Jesus Messiah, our hope has come. Jesus Messiah, our hope has come. Heaven lean closer that silent night to watch the Creator be born a child. Here in the manger, the Jesus Messiah, our hope has come. Jesus Messiah, our hope has come. No. Father, what a joy it is to, to worship you tonight, and you are truly the light of the world and our light, Lord, and we want to walk in you, we want to abide in you, and Lord, just draw close to you. Have your way in our midst tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening on the radio and online. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Um, this uh, 
Tomorrow night is the uh, Ladies Cookie and Sock Exchange. We've been talking about that for quite a while, but just a reminder, it's at 6.30 at uh, the Schufert's home, and there's information on the counter about that, but I think you guys are pretty well up to speed on that. And then uh, uh, this Sunday, we're going to have uh, the children's program in the morning services, but also we're going to have a, a potluck lunch after the second service, and we're going to go from there Christmas caroling. And so I encourage you guys to join with us. There's a, a sign-up on the, on the counter for that as well, and I'm looking forward to it. And then uh, Tuesday, the 24th, we're going to have our Christmas Eve candlelight service here at 7 o'clock. And then uh, no Wednesday night service because it's uh, Christmas Day. And then on the 31st, our prophecy update service. Uh, and then uh, the following one, or the next day, Wednesday the 1st, <coughs> no service that night either. Um, and then I, I just want to make a, a fast mention of the uh, uh, 2021 Israel trip coming up. Uh, we've got flyers out on the counter for that, and uh, if you get on our website, there's a really cool video you can watch. It gets you all excited about what we did last time and what we're looking forward to next time. And so, you know, um, it's a great trip, and it's one of those things that really expand uh, your understanding of the Bible. And so I encourage you to, you know, prayerfully consider that. Father, thank you again for the opportunity just to be here tonight to worship you. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship.
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning
Lord, you have our attention, and every eye is fixed on you. Burn away every distraction so you can move. Come and move. Let's sing that again. Lord, you have Every eye is fixed on you. Burn away every distraction so you can move. Come and move. And we won't hesitate. And we won't hesitate to bring you praise. Open. Lord, you won our 
Gracious Father, we sense, Lord, the, the reality of your presence here tonight. Lord, we, un we understand that you want to do something. Lord, you want to work in our hearts and reveal yourself afresh to us. And Lord, we want to hear your voice and we want to see you. We want to hear you. We want to sense your presence, Lord, your touch. And so guide us this night. Help us, Father. Pour out your spirit upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. Why don't you turn and say hello to somebody? <laughs> All right, come here, you. Right. 
All right. Well, hey, it's time to pray for uh, little ones going back to Wednesday school. Hey, buddy. <laughs> right on, cowboy. All right. Any more? Hey, Troy. On it, buddy. Nope. <laughs> Don't worry. Your sister will protect you. All right. Is that reinforcements coming or are they uh, the advance guard? Well, Father, um, we thank you for these awesome kids. And Lord, we pray truly that your hand would be upon them tonight, that you would bless them, that you would teach them and instruct them in your ways. We ask, Lord, you would bless those that are ministering to them, and may they simply reflect, Lord, your love and your joy to these kids. And so speak to their hearts, Lord, and, and draw them to yourself. Thank you for what you're going to do. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. There you go. Okay. All right. Go get them. <laughs> well, um, tonight we're going to kind of finish off our study of the rapture. Uh, I, don't, I kind of rushed through the, the last part of what we did last week. And so we're going to back up a little bit and a little bit of review, uh, maybe a little bit of overlap, and then we're going to kind of uh, take it from there. But uh, if you will, open up your Bibles to uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. And we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 4 together, and then we'll get into the actual study. And so once you get your Bibles open, if you're able, uh, would you stand with us in reverence for God's Word as we read it together? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1 says, uh, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of or, and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life and to mind your own business and to work with your hands as we commanded you, and that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. But I, don't, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so we will be with him, uh, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Uh, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the, morning, uh, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Gracious Father, we are comforted. Lord, we're comforted, we're excited. Uh, we can hardly wait. And, and we ask, Lord, you would just help us understand what it's going to be like and, and what's going to happen, that we can encourage and, and comfort others. So guide us, Lord. Help us to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. Well, Titus tells us, or actually uh, Paul writing to Titus tells us, uh, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, again, we're kind of going to go over various aspects of the rapture. Uh, and, and the rapture is really that event uh, when Jesus comes uh, part way back from heaven, if you will. He calls uh, for the church, his bride to himself, 
And in that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're, we're caught up together to be with him forever in, in, in heaven, you know, because wherever he is is heaven. And so uh, we're, we're called away from our earthly habitation. It, it will happen suddenly. It'll happen without warning uh, when we're caught up to be with Jesus forever. Uh, after the rapture, uh, God will pour out uh, his wrath upon a sinful world, which will culminate in the second coming of Jesus. And so the order of things, again, is first it's the rapture, and then the tribulation, the pouring out of God's wrath, then after that, the second coming of Jesus. And so uh, making that distinction that the second coming is a separate, distinct event uh, from the rapture of his church. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, you know, here we are at the Christmas season, and when you see all the decorations going up, then you know Thanksgiving's right around the corner. And uh, it, it's kind of funny how that works, but uh, God's intent... Uh, is that we, and, and I think every church age, uh, would be uh, convinced that, that we are in the last days. I am so convinced I can't even tell you. You know, just uh, looking at the news, watching the events that are taking place, comparing it to the scriptures, uh, we are in the last days, and so we should behave accordingly. Uh, we should know that time is short and have that sense of expectancy. Uh, literally, the rapture can take place at any time, and, and it's going to be a, a, a wonderful event uh, for those that know Jesus, uh, for those that don't know Jesus, it's going to be a time of confusion. It's going to be a time of desperation, and, and it's going to be a horrible time uh, because uh, all the good people, so to speak, and, and I define good people as those that know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, uh, they're going to be caught up. They're going to be gone, you know, and, uh, and then people are going to be bewildered about what happened. Um, the rapture, again, can take place at any time. There aren't any prophetic events, uh, prerequisites, if you will, that have to be in place. Uh, everything is, is you know, um, completed, if you will. Uh, there is only one kind of a, a practical requirement left, uh, and, and that will signal the end. But in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, ta Paul talks about uh, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, this, this church age, it's the time of the Gentiles. It's the time when, when the Lord is focused primarily on the church. And when the last Gentile, when the last non-Jewish person receives Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, the fullness of the Gentiles is complete, that's the trigger, if you will, uh, for the rapture. And so we're looking forward to that. Uh, and the rapture happens before the second coming, as we kind of laid out the order there. And so when you see the events of uh, the second coming lining up, all the circumstances and, and the requirements, if you will, laid out, when you see that stuff building up, building up, building up, uh, that just tells you that the, the rapture is imminent. It, it literally could happen at any time. If you will, turn to um, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There are requirements uh, or, or, or things that have to kind of happen before Jesus can come back in the second coming. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 8, we see a few of them. Uh, I'm going to read you just a, a short passage here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 1, it says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, uh, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, or, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, or, do, or, or as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, we, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children uh, so affectionately. Oops. <laughs> I'm reading from First Thessalonians. I go, this is good stuff, but it's not what I... <laughs> Sorry about that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now one, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, why did you guys say something? <laughs> You're all kind of going, it doesn't match! <laughs> Heretic! No. <laughs> yeah, if I'm reading the wrong thing, tell me. But uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are gathered together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word 
or by letters is it from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you uh, by any means, for that day, meaning the, the terrible day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, uh, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be that he is God. Do you not remember uh, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that uh, what is restraining, uh, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so from this passage, we get three or four things that are, in a sense, kind of have to be in place before Jesus will come back. And if you look back at the, at the, at the text for a second here, uh, he says it's going to be a, a, a time of falling away, a time of apostasy. Is anybody seeing that today? So we're going to talk about that on Sunday morning. But then he also says uh, there that the, there'll be the revealing of the Antichrist. Does anybody know who the Antichrist is yet? But the, when, when, when he is known, that's, that's one of the conditions that will be met. The, the other thing is he's going to be in the temple and he's going to, be demand, he's going to demand to be worshipped as God in the temple. That means there has to be a temple. There's no temple today. But when there is a temple, okay, and that's one of the requirements. Of the, and then the earth is going to go through the time of the great tribulation and judgment. And, you know, we've got earthquakes and we've got different things that are happening here and there, volcanoes erupting and stuff. But it's not the great tribulation. It's nothing like what's described in the book of Revelation. And so when these things all are, are in place, that means that the, the second coming is all the more imminent. But we're seeing, like I said, things before that. And so, you know, Jesus gave his disciples the signs, really, of his second coming and the end of the world back in the, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. And, and here he talks about there will be a, a time of deception. Anybody seen that? Can, do you trust the media? Do you trust your politicians? You know, all these things. I mean, there's, it's a time of, you know, lies, deception. Uh, the, there'll be false Christs and wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilence and false prophets and lawlessness. And, and, and these are all the things that Jesus said to expect and to look for prior to a second coming. And so we're seeing those things in place now, which again means the rapture is all the more imminent. Again, there aren't any conditions or requirements for the rapture, so we're told to watch and to be ready, you know, to, to have your bags packed, so to speak, and, and be ready to go. Jesus told his disciples in, in Matthew 24, verse 44, he said, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. And, and, and again, you know, what should we be doing? We should be, first off, right with God. We should be right with God and walking in his ways, walking in the Spirit, denying the lust of flesh, all those different kinds of things. Whatever, what does it constitute to be a Christian? I mean, we can talk about the basics, about the gospel and about receiving him, but that we should walk like Christians and act like Christians and, and behave like, you know, the godly people that God's called us to. That's part of the whole being ready process. But he also told us in verse 46, he said, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. And what he's saying is waiting and watching, you know, looking for the soon return of Jesus. And so that, that causes us to act differently. As Jesus described the, the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, part of it that bothers me is that all ten virgins fell asleep. But as the account continues, Jesus relates that five of them, when they, when they, when they all woke up, when they realized that the, the groom was coming, they all woke up, but half of them figured, figured out, hey, I don't have any oil for my lamp. You know, they're not ready to go. The other five had oil in their lamps, and they were ready to go. So the five that were ready took their oil, and oil always represents in the Bible the Holy Spirit. They were, their vessel was filled with the Holy Spirit. Get it? They are born again. They're the ones that were received into the, the wedding uh, party. The five that didn't have the oil went out to go find some, and then came back at a point when it was too late, and the groom said, away from me, I never knew you. And so the, the idea is we have to be ready. And, and the only way you can be ready is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't, if you're not born again, you're not ready, you're not going. And so it, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. But, but the other part of this is, and the part that kind of bothers me about this parable, 
is that all 10 of them fell asleep. There was a, a, a sense of apathy. There was a sense of fatigue or something. I'm not sure what. Were basically the, the, the 10 virgins that represent the church in a way, or the world, uh, the church in part though, uh, but they were sleeping. They, they weren't awake. They weren't waiting. They weren't watching. And, and my prayer is for us that we would do what Jesus said and, and be alert and, and be paying attention to what's going on and be looking for him. You know, Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, he said, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, and not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, walk in the Spirit and be ready. You know, that's, that's the safe place. You know, we can debate whether you know, a, a, a carnal Christian has the Holy Spirit in him, but you know, behaving like you know, a worldly person or whatever, you know, are they saved or not? Are they going to go in the rapture or not? Yeah, you can argue back and forth. But I tell you what, when you're abiding in Christ and, and you're, you're, you're in the middle of his will, it removes all the question marks. And I personally don't want to live under a question mark. And so I want as much as I can, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to sanctify my heart, my life, my behavior, and, and live for him, knowing that today could be the day. You know, and so, you know, just, well, it could be. What I would tell you is that the church, the true church, if you will, uh, will not go through the great tribulation. That's, that's a pre-tribulation uh, standpoint or, or viewpoint. There are other viewpoints on this. I mean, we teach and we believe... I, the, the pre-tribulation rapture, but there are people that believe in a mid-trib, uh, a post-trib, and uh, some jokingly, I think, have talked to about a pan-trib. You know, pre-trib is before the rapture, or I mean, I'm sorry, before the, um, uh, 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 the tribulation. Mid-trib means it happens in the middle of it. Post-trib means it happens after it. And pan-trib is, ah, it'll all pan out. Uh, and, and it's kind of funny because I used to, you know, I've been told this, uh, people actually take that approach like they don't know, they don't care. And I think that in a sense it's like, you know, uh, true, it will all pan out. Wh whether you believe pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib, when the tribulation happens, I mean, when the, when, the, when the rapture happens, we're all gone. And like I've told other people that disagree with me, oh, we'll explain it to you on the way up. You know, it'll, they'll figure it out. But speaking of the tribulation, Jesus said in Luke 21, uh, verse 36, he said, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things uh, that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, there's two things to think about this when, when Jesus gives this, this admonition, if you will, this command. He says, Watch therefore and pray always. So what should we be doing? We should be praying. <laughs> we should be praying. And he says, Pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Why would he tell us to pray about us being able to escape all these things if escaping all these things wasn't his plan? I mean, why would he tell us to do something if it wasn't like what he intended to do or, or, or possible anyway? And so the idea here is that Jesus, in a sense, pointed us towards a pre-tribulation rapture. Turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 1. In, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 19, this is the key to understanding really the entire book of Revelation. It's the outline uh, for the book. And in, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 19, uh, John lays out, he says, write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And so it's broken up into three sections, the things that you've seen, the things which are presently, and the things which will take place after this, future events. These three sections. And so uh, the first part, uh, the things which you've seen. That's Revelation chapter 1, okay, the vision of Jesus glorified, walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, you know, those this description and stuff. And so that's what you've seen. That's in a, in a past tense sense. But then the things which are, the middle of verse 19, that's chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. 
It's the church age. There, Jesus writes letters to seven literal churches. And these seven literal churches represent seven periods of church history. When we get into the book of Revelation, we'll go through that way more extensively. But the, the seven real churches that represent seven periods of church history, but they also represent seven types of churches that are in our midst today. And, and, and so the things that are, the church age, and so it describes these, these seven letters to the seven churches. And then after that, the last part of verse 19, and the things which will take place after this, and so you get through the description of Jesus in chapter 1, you've got the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, what chapter's next? Chapter 4, okay, the things after this. And the very first verse in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, is after these things, goes through this description. Mine, we're close on the board there, not quite. There we go. Metatauta, after these things. And the very next thing, one of the next things you see is the church worshiping God. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So after these things, the future things, you've got the church in heaven worshiping God, saying that he alone is worthy of all praise and honor and glory because he's created all things. That, that after these things continues in, in, in the chronological order, if you will, you get to Revelation chapter 5, and John's attention is drawn to the scroll, the, the title deed to the earth. <clears throat> and in verse 4, you see John weeping because nobody was qualified, if you will, found worthy to redeem uh, the title deed to the earth. <clears throat> but in verses 5 through 7, you see that Jesus, the, the Lamb of God, uh, is qualified and he begins to, <clears throat> sorry, I'm kind of losing my voice here. Uh, you see that he's beginning to uh, open the seals or Not open the seals at that moment, but he's the one that's found worthy. And so we see the redemption of the earth. But look at verses 8, eight 9, and 10. Revelation chapters five, chapter 5, verses 8, 9, and 10. <clears throat> now when he'd taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. You know, kind of talking about that future millennial time. But do you see the lyrics of the song? The church is saying, and, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. This is a song that only the church can sing. This is a song that only the redeemed can sing. Now, bear in mind, it, there's the past time, there's the, the present time in the church, then there's the future time in chronological order, and you have the church in heaven singing in chapter 4, singing another song in chapter 5, but then we're going to get to chapter 6, and all the seals are going to get opened up, and, and this progression starts, and the wrath of God is literally poured out upon the earth. But where's the church when that's happening? in the presence of God, seeing that we are the redeemed and that we're the only ones that can sing that song. And, and so it just points to, again, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. You know, Jesus told his disciples about the, the signs of a second coming and the great tribulation that would precede the end of the age. But then he told them in, in, in Luke 21, 36 again, watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. So, the Antichrist is not yet revealed, but uh, we see the power of the enemy at work in our world today. There we go. There you go again. All right. Um, only the presence of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit restrains evil. And that's what we read about in, in Revelation, I'm sorry, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, uh, talking about he that restrains will restrain until he's, you know, pulled back, if you will. And so it's the power of the Holy Spirit that, that keeps evil at bay in our presence now. And, uh, and even to the Philadelphian church, he's, Jesus said, you have a little strength. The church in Philadelphia, you know, the, the church of brotherly love, the, 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 the church that, that, that there's no rebuke, there's no correction. 
thinks the church, in a sense, is doing it right. And he says, but you have little strength. And I think about the church today in general. Sometimes we, don't, we have little strength because of the compromises in the church. But even the churches, that, in a sense, are doing it right, don't really have much of a voice in the world today. Very little strength. And so it's, it's kind of sad to see that. But again, we see the events of uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, you know, lining up with the, the things that you see there in, um, uh, in chapter 6 of Revelation. Uh, and again, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verses 7 and 8. Uh, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, meaning the Holy Spirit, who now restrains, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I, I kind of laid out a couple things about why I think the, the, the pre-tribulation rapture is the correct perspective on this. And others, there are people that have, you know, their arguments in favor of their position. But I'm not going to go through all those things. Uh, I'm just going to point out a few things as to why I think the pre-tribulation rapture is correct. Uh, one of them is in uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 9, where Paul says, Much more than being justified by his blood, blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, the whole point of the cross is that when Jesus died on the cross, he took upon himself all the sins of the world, all mankind. And God poured out his wrath upon Jesus, okay, uh, in, in retribution, if you will, for those sins, you know, because the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus took upon himself on the cross the wrath of God in full payment, if you will, for our sins. That's why when it was all said and done, Jesus said, it is finished, it is paid in full. So God's not going to pour his wrath out on us again, because that would be like double dipping, double jeopardy or whatever. And, and so that will not happen. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ means that the wrath has already been atoned for, if you will. We, the church, are not appointed to wrath. I can't say that for the rest of the world. In, uh, in Romans chapter 1, Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now let me ask you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, does that describe the believer or non-believer? That, that passage in Romans describes the non-believers. It describes those that kind of thumb their nose at God and, and live a life completely diametrically opposed to God. The wrath of God will be poured out upon them. And so it isn't consistent with the nature of God to judge the righteous with the wicked. You know, Jesus told us that, that as Christians that we're going to have true relation in this world. Jesus taught that the world hated him and it'll hate us. But there's a big difference between persecution and the wrath of God. You know, persecution's a horrible thing, and if you're going through it, you know, I, I don't want to diminish that in any way, but it doesn't compare to the wrath of God. Jesus told his disciples in, in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so when it comes to the, the, the persecution, you know, uh, when, when Satan pours out his wrath, which is minuscule compared to the wrath of God, but when Satan does that, the target is always God's children. Always. And, and it's not just, you know, it's not the whole world. Uh, when God is the source of judgment, then it's a different story. God already judged our sins on the cross of Jesus, so we don't have to worry about his wrath. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. He bore the full weight of our sins so we wouldn't have to. I'm going to give you a couple of examples that we find in the Bible of a pre-tribulation rapture of sorts. In uh, Genesis chapters 18 and 19, the angel, uh, the angel of the Lord uh, appears to uh, Abraham at one point, and after they have a meal, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord begins to explain to uh, Abraham uh, that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Abraham knows that uh, his nephew Lot and his family uh, reside in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abraham begins to negotiate. Well, Lord, if you found 50 righteous, will you still destroy the city? And the Lord says, no, if I find 50 righteous, I won't destroy the city. Now, that's interesting. Just stop there. We, we, we don't even get to Lot's family yet. 
But if he finds 50 righteous, he won't, just, he won't pour out his wrath upon them. He won't destroy the city. That's a clue. <laughs> so you know how the story goes. Uh, uh, Abraham goes, well, if there's 40, then if there's 30, and there's 20. He gets down to 10. And if you go through the account in, in Genesis and you examine Lot's family, you'll find out that Lot and his wife had uh, sons and daughters and, and sons-in-law and daughters-in-law that add up to 10. <laughs> and so when, when Abraham was negotiating, he was negotiating for his own family. And he stopped at 10 because he, if he went any lower, that would be eliminating family members. But the bottom line is, is that God wouldn't destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah until he got Lot's family out of there. And, and the angels found Lot, and, and he's referred to as righteous Lot at the city gate. And, and Lot is a type of the church. Now, is Lot the most outstanding Christian person you've ever seen? Not necessarily. You could point out some flaws there. So perfection isn't the issue, is it? it but he's righteous Lot. How are we righteous? By faith. Okay, same thing for him. And so even though he wasn't perfect, he believed, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, just as like it was to Abraham. And so we read in, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9, um, speaking of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from, from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then, verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to preserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to separate the sheep from the goats. God knows how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And, and he does that. When God is the source of judgment, then God will deliver the righteous out of the judgment. You look at the flood of Noah's time back in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, you read, And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his heart was evil continually. And so God acknowledges the, the sinful nature, basically, of just about all the men. But a chapter before that, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, we see that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And what's the deal here? In Genesis chapter 6, God is uh, laying out his justification, if you will, for wiping out the world, for destroying the world. His wrath is poured out through the flood. But before his wrath is poured out, there's a righteous man uh, by the name of Enoch, and God pulls him out before the judgment. That's a clue. Then God protected and sheltered Noah through the judgment. You look at the, uh, the book of Daniel. At one point, Nebuchadnezzar made a statue and ordered that everybody bow down to it when the music was played and stuff. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, basically refused. Uh, then at, at one point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar orders that they're tossed into the fire. And so they're, they're thrown into the furnace. is heated seven times more. They're thrown into the furnace. The, the guys throwing them in died in, in the process of throwing them in there. But then as Nebuchadnezzar and his, and, his, and his guys look, look, we threw three men in there, but I see a fourth like the Son of Man walking around. And so they, they call him out. Eventually they come out, you know, they don't even smell like smoke. But my question to you is, where was Daniel? There's no mention of Daniel. He, 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 he wasn't part of that. He was, he was saved or spared from that, if you will. And, and so, you know, God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. And so you've got Enoch, you've got Lot, and you've got Daniel all pretty much in the same boat. That's, again, I think why Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.9, God has not appointed us to wrath. Um, <clears throat> in Romans 5.9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. And again, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed or poured out against all the ungodliness and, and righteousness of men. But these things do not describe, do not describe the child of God. Now, the mid-trib and the post-trib, I'm going to ignore the pan-trib for a while, <clears throat> but the mid-trib and the post-trib, by default, in a certain se sense, declares, my Lord delays his coming. There's a, a general attitude and mentality if it's not going to happen before, and if it's going to happen in the middle of or after, they're saying, we don't have to worry about this now because we haven't seen these other things happen yet. In, in, in a way, they're saying, my Lord delays his coming. Jesus warned us of that. In, uh, in Matthew 24, 
uh, verses 48 and forward, <clears throat> uh, we read, um, But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him, and, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The point is, if you're in a, a mid- or post-trib mindset, then you're not looking for Jesus every day, are you? You don't think it could happen any day. You're thinking all these other things have to be in place, meaning the Antichrist, the temple, all the other stuff. You're looking for all that kind of stuff. You're not looking for Jesus. It's a wrong focus to begin with. But when you're looking for the Antichrist and, and you're in no, no big hurry, if you're in the pre-trib mindset, uh, but if you're in the pre-trib mindset, you're looking for Jesus with a real sense of expectancy. And that's the whole point. If you live like tomorrow could be the big test, then the chances are you're going to be getting ready the whole time. But if you're thinking it's going to be next week, next month, or whatever, then you're not in a big hurry to get ready because it, there's no sense of urgency. And he wants us to live with a sense of urgency because it, it, it changes our behavior. It changes our attitude. It changes our focus. And again, I'd rather be focused on, you know, looking for Jesus. I don't want to be caught looking for the Antichrist. I mean, I've spent my time, like other people have, hey, hey I wonder if it could be that guy. I wonder if it could be that guy, you know? I mean, if, if you listen to the news, it's like five guys a week. And uh, I tell you what, one time I was with a meeting of pastors, you know, the last time I went to that meeting, and um, <clears throat> it, they were discussing uh, uh, the impending uh, elections and uh, uh, President, uh, former President Obama getting elected. And one guy was described uh, the president, uh, President Obama, as being, quote-unquote, uh, the spirit of Antichrist. And the whole table just blew up. Wow. Everybody just got, you know, this huge thing started. And, uh, and because the, almost all the pastors there were very liberal, and they were supporting Obama. And, uh, and so I tried to calm him down. I said, whoa, hang on here. He didn't say he was the Antichrist. He said he's got the spirit of Antichrist. And that didn't calm him down a whole lot. And I said, there's a difference. The Antichrist, we, we, you know, I'm not going to call him the Antichrist. But he certainly is the spirit of Antichrist because you look at his, his, his policies and, and the things that he stands for. He, he's totally pro-abortion. He's, he's for the murder of the innocent children. That's something the Antichrist would be in favor of. He's in favor of uh, uh, all the homosexual rights and the homosexual movement, all that kind of stuff. He's, he's totally you know, pro all that stuff. That's something that the Antichrist and the, 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 the devil himself would be you know, put in line with. And, and, and there was a bunch of other things like that. And, uh, and, and so anyway, uh, they were mad at the first guy, then they got mad at me, and that was the last time I went to that, but it was kind of a lame thing. But anyway, the, the whole thing is, I don't want to be looking for the Antichrist. I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. You know, when my life gets messed up, it's because I've lost my focus. I, I'm looking at people, I'm looking at myself, I'm looking at circumstances. You know the old saying, if you, if you look at people long enough, you get mad. And if you look at yourself, you just get depressed. And so, but if you look at Jesus, everything works out pretty good. And so keep your eyes on Jesus. And so God's intent is that our perspective would be that we see ourselves as in the last generation and that he'll come in our lifetime. And again, it changes your perspective, but it changes your behavior. And, and like we started off this study in, in, in Titus uh, chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be looking for him not for the Antichrist. And so, again, that causes me to have kind of a, an urgency to share and to live the gospel. You know, if you're thinking that the Lord's not coming back for a long time, then what's the motivation to share the gospel? What's the motivation to live the gospel? But if you think he's coming back today, man, you know, you want to be ready. You want to have a correct perspective regarding material things. If you knew that Jesus was coming tonight or tomorrow morning, number one, you would worry about your house payment. <laughs> but you also wouldn't worry about, like, oh, no, who's going to scratch my car? Or, you know, who's going to take care of my stuff? You know, those things don't matter anymore. When you talk to people, and, I, and I've talked to a lot of people that have been on their deathbed in hospitals, and, and some have a lot of stuff, some don't have any stuff. 
But I tell you what, they don't care about their stuff. You know, in, in the last few hours of life, you know, oh, no, someone's going to rip off my tools or, you know, uh, my, my cougar hands. None, none of that matters. And when you're living for Jesus, that stuff matters a lot less, you know, because of the urgency of things. And quite honestly, if you know that Jesus is coming back tonight or, or the rapture could happen tonight, it makes you want to be right with God. It means that you that would live, a, uh, there'd be a purity in our lives and, and a sense of expectancy. We, we would set ourselves aside. We might spend time praying like, God, forgive me, purify my heart. You know, and, and, and you might be motivated maybe to talk to your, your, your family members or your neighbors or people that you love. And, and, and so there's that sense, just like Jesus said in, in Matthew 24, 46, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Do you guys want God's blessing? I want God's blessing. Blessed is that servant. And so this is a sure far away to, you know, get the, the, the blessing of God, if you will. We read in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Again, it's the, the, the priorities that we have in life. And if you have a right focus, then you'll have a right priority. It is important that we believe in the imminent return of Christ and even more in the imminent rapture of the church. I, that's why I think, uh, and that's kind of part of why we're doing the study to begin with, because a lot of people are pretty ignorant about the rapture. They're, they're, they're fairly ignorant about the end times. I know churches that won't teach the book of Revelation because they think it's all spooky and stuff, and, um, you know, or you can't understand it. And, uh, and as we go through it again, we've been through it once in our fellowship, but as we go through it again here in a few months, uh, you'll see that it's very understandable, and it's a lot more straightforward than people think. And, uh, and, but, but knowing that, you know, we want to study to show ourselves approved unto God we're going to need to not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly understanding uh, these issues. Um, I think I've read this the same scripture now four times, but I'll, I'll read it again. Uh, Luke 21, 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The point is, it shall come to pass. And we will stand before the Son of Man. And you want to stand before him, uh, not only as his friend, but ready to stand, you know, prepared. You know, there's been times when I got called up to my boss's office or to a chief's office or something like that. And there were times when I didn't know what I was going to be asked, like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> hope I've got the right answers. And there's other times when I knew ahead of time I was going to be called, so I did my homework and, you know, had stuff in my hand and ready to go. And, and I, you know, was prepared. Because you don't want to walk into those kinds of things clueless. And so we want to be ready. Again, like Paul said, knowing the time that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we first believed. And so we need to be waiting, we need to be watching, we need to be ready to meet him at any time. And my question to you is, are you ready? I mean, uh, when, you're going to see when we study through Isaiah on Sunday, um, there's a point where the Lord pretty much commends the, the real Israel as opposed to the poser Israel. And I, I think it speaks volumes to the real church as opposed to the poser church. And, you know, I'm not going to point fingers <clears throat> at any other denomination, any other group of people, but there is such a thing as, quote, unquote, the false church. And, um, and, and, people that have this false sense of security thinking that they're okay and they've been deceived, they've been duped, they've been sold a bill of goods. And, uh, and, and it's going to be a shame to stand before the Lord and realize, oh no, I'm not ready like I thought I was. And they're going to, but Pastor so-and-so told me, but you know, someone counseled me, but I read the book. And the question is going to be, but what did you do with my son? What did you do with my son? And so, again, we need to have a right focus and, and to be prepared. And I don't think that the, the mid-trib and the post-trib position prepares its adherence 
to face the Lord. But a, tree, a pre-trib position does prepare us to face our maker uh, and to be prepared for that meeting. And so that's one of the biggest issues behind that. But the bottom line is, man, I mean, it, I don't think the rapture is anything to fear if you're prepared. I mean, when I used to take my, my, my tests in you know, high school and, and junior college and that kind of stuff, when I studied, when I spent my time preparing and all that kind of junk, and I knew test day was coming, I didn't walk in the classroom going, oh, no, what's going to happen? I go, no, I studied my brains out. I'm ready for this. Let's go. You know, let's get this. Let's do it. And so I feel the same way about the rapture. If you know Jesus Christ as your first Lord and Savior, you're ready. It's like, woo bring it, Lord, bring it. You know, and so, Lord, bring it. Anyway, last week I went long. This week I'm going short. That's all there is to it. <laughs> uh, gracious Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for, for revealing the plan to us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for, for not keeping it such a, a big secret that we couldn't be prepared for. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us of your Holy Spirit to remind us of the things that you've told us, to lead us and guide us in the way, and that we are prepared in you, abiding in you. And we thank you for that. And we ask, Lord, that you would hasten the day. We ask it would be tonight, Lord. We ask that it would be now, Lord, because we want so much to be with you. And as we wait on you, Lord, give us the faith to be faithful with you. Help us to please you in the meantime, Lord. Help us to walk in your ways. Lord, we love you. We look forward to being with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and continue your worship. Silent night, holy night, all is calm.
joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. In heaven and heaven and nature sing. Let's sing that again. Joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Oh, the joy that fills my soul. Since my Savior set me free, oh, His love that makes me sing, and I will ever praise the King. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs implore, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy repeat the sounding joy repeat repeat the sounding joy oh the joy that fills my soul since my savior set me free oh his love it makes me sing and i will ever praise the king oh the joy Oh, the joy that fills my soul Since my Savior set me free Oh, His love, it makes me sing I will ever praise the King He rules the world He rules the world with truth and grace And makes the nations prove The glory of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love oh the joy that fills my soul since my savior set me free oh his love it makes me sing i will ever pray joy that fills my soul since my Savior set me free oh his love it makes me sing I will ever praise the King let's sing all the joy oh the joy that fills my soul since my Savior set me free oh his love and makes me sing and I will ever praise the King oh I will ever praise the King oh I will ever praise the King gracious Father that's our hope that we will one day ever 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 praise you for all of eternity in your presence Lord and Lord, we can hardly wait. We pray that you do come quickly. That you snatch us up to be with you, Father. And Oh, Lord, what a moment. What an awesome thing that's going to be. We rejoice in you, Lord. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee, and give peace. Well, I pray that you guys are not just uh, informed uh, about the rapture. Uh, but that you're excited for it. Uh, I pray that you anticipate it 
uh, I pray that you're ready for it. And I pray that you meditate on the fact that it could be any moment, any time. And as you go to sleep tonight, you wonder if you wake up in heaven. Yeah, because it be, it's going to be daytime in Jerusalem, nighttime here. Chances are it'll, it'll happen when you're sleeping. So, you know, when you go to bed at night, be ready. God bless you guys. Have a good night. If you need prayer for any reason, uh, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. Yes.